Subversion. The word adored and overused by amateur critics. Subversion. The word now detested the world over by Star Wars fans. Subversion. What the hell does it mean? And why do we hear about it all the time when it comes to stories? Hi guys, thanks for stopping by. Today on The Power of Stories, I'm going to talk about subversion. What it is, how it's used, the difference between good and bad subversion, and how you can incorporate it into your stories to create a lasting impact on your audience. Let's get started. What even is subversion? Basically, subversion is doing something the audience does not expect, specifically by breaking established storytelling and genre tropes. This can be done on a large scale across your entire story, where you craft a complete narrative that's designed to be subversive, or on a small scale in one little scene, where you craft a subversive moment to give unexpected flavor to a character or setting. But no matter the size of the subversion, the necessary element is that it does the opposite of what the general audience expects by purposely playing against the typical formula for its genre. So, for example, on the large narrative scale, we could talk about Alan Moore's graphic novel, Watchmen, the entirety of which is constructed with the purpose of subverting the typical story beats and character arcs of the superhero genre. Or we could talk The Last Jedi, which purposely attempts to subvert the space opera and, more specifically, the norms of the Star Wars franchise and the established characters therein. In both of these examples, the entire plot is constructed with intent to subvert. So, the story itself is a subversion. But on the small scale, we would look at individual scenes, for examples, such as Indiana Jones squaring off against the baddie with a sword in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Raiders is not a subversive film on the whole, but this particular scene is, because in typical genre action films, this confrontation would be followed by some type of action scene, where the protagonist would need to use wits or hand-to-hand combat skills to defeat this formidable opponent. But the anticlimactic shooting of the opponent subverts the expectation, while also informing us about Indy as a character. So there you have it, that's what subversion is. The act of surprising the audience with something they did not expect. Specifically, by breaking genre tropes, the norms of that particular story, or traditional storytelling conventions, and it can be done on the large scale as the purpose of the entire story, or on the small scale as a piece of character insight or world building in an otherwise traditional tale. But let's get something important out of the way before we go any further in our exploration. Subversion is not a synonym for great story or good writing. You see subversion or subversive thrown around by critics and fans trying to explain why a story is great. But subversion is a tool in storytelling, and it can be executed well or poorly. Just because a story has subversive twists doesn't make it a good or well-written story. It's something that a writer can try to do with their narrative. Whether they succeed or not comes down to how well they set up their subversion, then how well they pay it off. A subversion in one story might be a brilliant piece of storycraft, but a subversion in another might be terrible, terrible writing. And, as with most things in storytelling, it usually comes down to the execution. Game of Thrones accomplishes brilliant subversion in many instances by breaking established storytelling and genre tropes. Both Ned Stark's death and the Red Wedding are pop culture landmarks because of how well and how believably they subverted the audience expectation. But what you don't see behind the scenes is all the narrative setup that had to happen to make those subversions the smashing successes that they were. By contrast, The Last Jedi's attempts at subversion continually fell flat, because scenes that were intended as large payoff subversive moments 
didn't have the prior necessary narrative setup needed to make them land. These subversions largely got by on shock value. Any subversion that relies solely on shock value for its payoff is a bad subversion. Anybody can write something happening that the audience didn't expect. Subverting in and of itself is not an indication of quality. This comes out of nowhere. This comes out of nowhere. This comes out of nowhere. You get the picture. My rule of thumb for a good subversion is that the audience should be shocked by the development, but feel as if they shouldn't be. Basically, after looking back through what came before the subversion, the audience should be asking one question. How did I not see this coming? Now, there are really only two things that must be included in your story to accomplish this. These two elements are that you need to establish foreshadowing for the subversion, and you need to remain internally consistent with your own story, characters, and setting. The first way you make sure that subversion will land with your audience is to provide foreshadowing. This can be anywhere from subtle to obvious, but if it's too obvious, the subversion won't work, because the audience will, by and large, already know what's going to happen. But if it's too subtle, or not there at all, the audience will feel cheated by the deception, or think that the subversion doesn't make narrative sense. All this is to say that foreshadowing is an art in and of itself, and doing it well can be tricky. But it must be done, and it has to be done well to accomplish a successful subversion. But how do you use foreshadowing to pull off a successful subversion? Let's look at some examples. The most well-known and commonly accepted method of foreshadowing for subversion is to introduce and maintain flaws in your characters that are never properly resolved. For instance, Neon Genesis Evangelion successfully subverts the shonen and mecha genres by playing on all the tropes typical for those kinds of stories, but also showing deep and persistent flaws in all the major characters. Those flaws nag at both you and the characters themselves as they struggle through typical shonen trial after typical shonen trial. But instead of defeating those trials by overcoming their flaws, they tend to do so simply in spite of those flaws. On occasion, they might make a marginal step forward in improving, but in no instance are they actually able to conquer their individual demons to the result of lasting triumph. So, when tragedy starts to strike, it then dominoes into catastrophe after catastrophe. You're absolutely shocked by the brutal consequences playing out, but it also feels strangely inevitable. Shinji's apathy and feelings of abandonment result in horrifying consequences for the people he looks to for acceptance and love. But they're also struggling with their own problems, and all the vice, doubt, and insecurity slowly unravels the narrative from a typical shonen mecha into an existential crisis that threatens the world. A shocking subversion from the shonen hero's archetype, who conquers his flaws and uses the power of friendship to save the day. Watchmen, the classic graphic novel by Alan Moore, brilliantly subverts the superhero genre in the same way that Neon Genesis Evangelion did for Shonen, using the flaws of his characters as a vehicle for exploring how a real human, full of doubts, flaws, insecurities, and fears, might truly act with superhuman abilities and celebrity status. The flaws drive the narrative to a subversive conclusion that is shocking and yet not. Of course a man with the powers and perspective of a god would begin to feel detached from other people. It just feels natural, despite our surprise, and the sense of natural consequence in the midst of shocking developments plays out with every character, from Ozymandias' sense of narcissistic genius, We can do so much more. We can save this world. <laughs> with the right leadership. To Rorschach's inability to compromise. Never compromise. Not even in the face of Armageddon. 
Both Neon Genesis Evangelion and Watchmen are widely held to be subversive masterpieces for writing character flaws that lead to their natural conclusion if never properly faced and overcome. If we'd only paid attention to those nagging flaws, we wouldn't be left asking, how did I not see this coming? Now, if two of the most renowned subversions in pop culture history have pulled off their twists with character flaws, then it's safe to say that using them might just be the most popular method of foreshadowing subversions out there in modern storycraft. But it's not the only method. Let's look at a couple others. Now, usually being inconsistent with your storytelling and world building is a big no-no. In fact, remaining consistent with your world, characters, themes, and narrative is the second rule for pulling off a successful subversion. However, using inconsistencies can be a great vehicle for foreshadowing if, by the end of your story, you've shown those inconsistencies to actually be consistent. They just seemed out of place at the time. The murder mystery genre is kind of predicated on this idea, that information later in the plot will recontextualize information you received earlier to tie together the killer's motives. But I'm more into sci-fi and fantasy than murder mystery, so I'm going to use Near Automata, the video game masterpiece by Yoko Taro, as an example. Near Automata uses inconsistencies within the first and second acts of its story to pay off its twists in the subversive final act. The protagonist, 2B, is established within the first several minutes of the game to be a stoic and efficient android, with little to no interest in anything outside of her mission objectives. Emotions are prohibited. <laughs> Sorry, ma'am. The people around her seem more like tools to aid her in completing her tasks than allies, and she treats them, most notably her assigned partner, 9S, with a cold and detached attitude. So when we see outbursts of intense emotion in this typically stoic warrior, it feels really out of character, particularly when that emotion is brought about by some threat to 9S's safety. This happens several times throughout the early acts, as do other moments where 2B portrays brief hints of warmth toward 9S that she quickly smothers and hides. Roger that, 9... Is, uh... Huh? Wait, what did you just say? Roger that, 9S. Wait, no, that's not what you said. You said nines, or at least something close to. Cut the chatter and engage the enemy. Both the displays of raw emotion and the occasional hints of affection feel very jarring to the player because they're noticeably inconsistent with who we believe to be to be. <laughs> to be to be. Anyway, sorry. But as the third and final act begins to play out, new information subverts what we've believed to be the purpose of the androids, the causes behind their millennia-long war with the machines, and the nature of the relationships between these characters themselves. All the inconsistencies within 2B's character and within the world building get recontextualized with this new information, making everything actually consistent instead of inconsistent. We just didn't have the full picture yet, since we were seeing things from a particularly naive or uninformed point of view. But the clues are all there, hidden in the jarring inconsistencies of the world and the actions of 2B. If we'd truly paid attention to the perceived inconsistencies the first time around, we might not be asking, how did I not see this coming? And the last way we're going to cover foreshadowing a subversive twist is to include clues for the subversion in the tone of the story itself. Madoka Magica managed to subvert the magical girl genre by foreshadowing its dark twists through the tone. Shows in the magical girl genre, such as Sailor Moon, tend to have a whimsical and magical feeling to them, where you have a sense of wonder and hope permeating the narrative through the elements that make up its tone. But Madoka Magica, though it has some of the aesthetic of a traditional magical girl story, 
to lull you into a sense of familiarity and complacency, balances its use of traditional magical girl art styles and tropes with a palpable sense of foreboding. The tone feels ominous, like something's not quite right, and you can't really put your finger on it. The supernatural creature, common to this genre for blessing the characters with their magic powers, feels kind of creepy instead of cute, with the camera angle focusing on its stare for far too long. The music is often suspenseful and ominous, instead of full of tinkling bells and happy tunes. It all registers almost on a subconscious level until the first major subversive twist hits, and then the weirdly sinister tone of it all suddenly rushes to the forefront of your mind as you gape in horror. And it all just works. The subversion feels earned because of that nagging sense of wrongness you've had from the start. You never could properly explain why you had such a heavy sense of anxiety throughout the happy magical discovery portion of the plot. But once the subversive moments start, the tone of that early portion comes back to you, and you ask yourself, how did I not see this coming? That is a well-executed subversion, and Madoka Magica accomplishes it through the foreshadowing in the tone. Now, I'm going to start out talking about consistency by first emphasizing that maintaining consistency within all aspects of your story is something you should be doing anyway. However, for the purposes of this discussion, I'm just addressing why it's important to remain consistent with the specific aspect of the story that's being subverted. So, for example, if your subversion hinges upon the actions and results of a particular character's choices, that character and their actions need to remain consistent both within the context of who they are as an established character, and in relation to the subversion and its consequences. That's why Ned Stark's arc works as a subversion, and Luke Skywalker's arc doesn't. Ned's death is the natural result of his naive choices, and the natural choice of Joffrey in this kind of instance. It's absolutely in character for Ned to make the honorable decisions he does that land him in prison and lead to his being on the executioner's block. It is also absolutely in character for Joffrey to act impulsively, vindictively, and against the counsel of his advisors, who advise restraint. This entire situation is consistent with who these characters are, so even though we're shocked at Ned's execution, it seems inevitable when we look at the two principal characters who are involved in this moment coming about. Of course Ned would choose to carry out his ascent to Regent in the most honorable way possible, leaving noticeable opportunities for his less scrupulous, more ruthless, and more adept political rivals. Of course Joffrey would gleefully carry out the execution instead of offer a politically savvy pardon. He's been established as a politically inept character from the beginning of the narrative, with a cruel streak matched only by his headstrong penchant for doing exactly what he wants when he can get away with it. Because of its consistency with who the characters are, we're left wondering, why did I not see this coming? Luke Skywalker's subversion, on the other hand, fails for the same reason that Ned Stark's succeeds. Ned's fate is consistent with both who we know him to be and who we know the people around him to be. Luke's portrayal as an embittered, pessimistic cynic fails because it's not consistent with who Luke Skywalker is as an established character. As I've said before, I do think you could successfully subvert Luke and his ideals if it was carefully written, but to do so you'd have to remain consistent with his established character and provide a situation in which his known traits and personality backfire. For instance, it would have made much more sense to try subverting him by playing on the established trait that he sees the good in people. Perhaps, instead of his faith in people paying off like it did with Vader's conversion back to the light side of the Force, his dogmatic belief in the good in people might backfire with Kylo, with Kylo choosing the dark side of the Force in the climactic narrative moment to drastic and subversive consequences. 
This change in the fundamental source of the subversion seems to me to be at least internally consistent with the character instead of the completely opposite Luke we saw in the real film. So as part of the conclusion, to summarize these rules on how to craft a successful subversion, Let's do a final example with the Red Wedding from Game of Thrones. This subversion was so well written and so well received that it's now a historic pop culture moment, and it accomplished that by foreshadowing the event and by remaining internally consistent with its characters, setting, and plot. Now, I'm not going to address every single way in which the Red Wedding uses foreshadowing and consistency because that would take a 30 minute video on its own to do the subversion justice. I'll just hit some of the high points to give you an idea of how it fulfilled these two crucial elements. There are a lot of ways in which this was foreshadowed, some of them very small and subtle, such as Roos Bolton's dialogue earlier in the episode, while others are more blatant, such as Walder Frey's dialogue. There's also foreshadowing in the tone, with the dimly lit setting, and with some of the unsettling dialogue. Not to mention Rob Stark's flaws coming to fruition. George R. R. Martin uses foreshadowing well to set this up, but where it's really outstanding is in how consistent everything is with what plays out. Nothing about this twist feels unearned or unjustified. Looking back at the narrative with fresh eyes after the massacre gives us further and further appreciation for how inevitable it seems. It makes us wonder even more with every viewing how did I not see this coming? It's just completely consistent with every character, from Walder Frey's reputation for pettiness and disloyalty, to Ruse Bolton's willingness to do unsavory things for the advancement of his house, to Rob's own naive sense of love and honor that lands the Starks in this situation. It's consistent with the world building and the plot as well. Martin crafted a world that we should have known by that point functions off of cause and effect, since it's based more on historical events from real medieval history instead of classic storytelling payoffs, which would have lent more to moral and thematic interpretations of cause and effect. Instead of characters getting what they morally deserve or what they thematically deserve, in Martin's world they get what they logically deserve. They reap what they sow, whether good or bad, based on how they handle complex political maneuvering, as opposed to how they handle ethical dilemmas, which would be the case in most fairy tales or mythologies that fantasy fiction is often based on. We've been told repeatedly that Walder Frey is an opportunistic, cruel, and petty lord who holds grudges for decades. We've been told repeatedly that Rob is his father's son, a brilliant battlefield commander and an honorable man, but unwilling or unable to handle the political maneuvering that is an inevitable part of conflict in the Seven Kingdoms. We've been told repeatedly that Tywin Lannister is not just a competent battlefield commander, but also one of the most ruthless and shrewd players of Machiavellian politics alive. This all adds up to being exactly what would happen. It's all so consistent as to be completely airtight from critiques of convenience or unbelievability. And the foreshadowing is everywhere, from the way the world is constructed to what the characters say and how they behave. This is perhaps the most famous subversion in modern storytelling, and the reason for that is because it's quite possibly the most well-constructed, best-written subversion in modern fiction. So what's the takeaway here? Subversion is a tool you can use in Storycraft, and like any tool, it can be used to great effect or used poorly. If you want to craft a subversion that's well received by your audience and leaves them enamored with your story, you have to give that subversion a proper setup by using competent foreshadowing and by making the resulting payoff consistent with the characters, setting, and plot of your story. Do that, and instead of an audience that feels cheated because you just yanked the rug out from under them with no warning, you'll have a satisfied audience wondering in awe, how did I not see that coming?